Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. And let's go to the Lord in prayer for our time in Bible study as always. Father, we thank you this morning for the time that you devoted to our hearts and our minds that we might learn of you and learn from you. Lord, this uh, new concept, we love the word new, this new concept of the law of God being made internal to us, written on our hearts, that, that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us once we are born again. Lord, it's a, it's a fascinating thought, but it's more than that. It's a, it's a sense, it's a power, it's a desire that is equal to yours. And Lord, we've had that in our conscience all along, but we never had the power to do. And so we are most thankful for the promises that we find here in the book of Hebrews. And, and as we kind of zero in on exactly that this morning, this new power available to us, Lord, I, I pray that you would bring to the full comprehension of everyone here that this is not only available and not only possible, uh, but also practical and powerful. And Lord, I pray that everyone here today, and perhaps those watching online, would come to the full comprehension that uh, religion is dead. It has no power at all, it has no effect. And that the only thing that matters to you is, is a loving relationship with you by those that you have created for that, that very purpose, to love you in return. And we lift up these thoughts and these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. That says a lot, doesn't it? For those Jewish believers, and remembering that the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers in the first century, prior to the destruction of the temple by General Vespasian, Roman General Vespasian in 70 AD. So these Jewish believers, if they're at Jerusalem, and probably the bulk of them were in, in that first church that arose after the day of Pentecost, now in the early 60s AD, evidently, uh, in this writing, addressed to these Jewish believers that are still in the midst of all this um, sacrament, ritual, practice going on around them, um, the existence, the continuing existence of the Jewish faith they have been completed out of. And, and those are the people most specifically that this book is addressed to, although this becomes a wonderful apologetic, which means an explanation uh, of the basis for our Christian faith, and, and especially the basis for our trust that righteousness is according to faith and not by works. And, and this book really fleshes out all of that, so to speak, or spirits out, all of that, so to speak. So for those Jewish believers, still with what their eyes are seeing, still with what their noses are smelling, still with what their ears are hearing, still with what their hearts may be drawn to out of familiarity, for those Jewish believers wondering if this new sacrificial faith had the same emotional impact as the old one did, I believe Paul, as the author of Hebrews, writes, this is the main point. This is what I've been directing all of this in the first seven chapters to. That's why I've said what I've said so far. This is the point that I desire to make. So when we see that, that this is the main point, we need to pay attention to what the main point is, don't we? This is the main point of everything he's been saying so far. And if you haven't been with us, you're kind of diving in at, at probably a pretty good place because, as it says in the King James Bible, this is the sum of, of all that's been said in the first seven chapters. But there's a lot of meat in the first seven chapters that you might want to go back and check out online, especially knowing those messages are available. This is the main point. And the main point is this. Christ, who is... Remember, 
God in flesh, God incarnate. He is the Word made flesh. All the way back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that he would be Emmanuel, which literally means God in flesh, God with skin on. This is the main point, God with skin on, the Christ, the Messiah, offering himself as the definite article, underscore, 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 as the sacrifice for our sin. And cut to the chase, God in flesh sacrificing himself to pay the price for our sin is vastly superior to laying hands on bulls and goats as emotional an experience as that may have been. And indeed, that would be a very emotional experience, that thinking about the, the sacrificial rites, um, you would bring an animal that was precious to you, an animal that was without spot, without blemish, couldn't have a broken bone, you know, couldn't be disabled. It would be, chiefly, the desire would be that it would be the most, in an agricultural society, the most valuable animal that you owned. Or in a, in a more gentrified society in the city, perhaps one of the pets that you had living with you in your house. And the requirement was that when you committed sin, and, and everyone commits sin, that, that you would present yourself before the priest, and the priest would inspect the animal. He wouldn't, he wouldn't bother inspecting you because the very fact that you've come with an animal means that, that you're a sinner. You've fallen, you've done something wrong, and so you've brought an animal that's precious to you, and, and in this day and age, if we were going to identify, how many of you have pets? How many of you love your pet? I mean, really, really love your pet. So what we're talking about here under the old covenant system, under the rituals and practices of the Jewish faith, that pet would be brought to the priest and the Levites. And you would lay your hand upon that pet after it had been inspected for perfection because it, it had to, you know, everything was pointing to Christ and it's the perfection of the sacrifice. So you would lay your hands on the head of that animal. And as that animal was standing there on all fours, its throat would be slit by the Levites. And blood would begin to pour out as the, the main arteries um, flowed. And, and you would feel under your hands that animal falter and first go to its knees and then go down on its stomach and then lay upon its side. And that would be a very, very emotional experience for everyone, I suppose even the most hardened, and they would recognize the point that God is trying to make through the sacrifice for sin is that sin kills. You may not think so, but sin always kills. And the eventuality of, of death that we're talking about is eternal death. We're talking about eternal damnation if that sin condition remains. So, Instead of sacrificing for God in this new system, instead of sacrificing for God, think of it, God sacrifices himself for you. That's the main point. Also, as we see in verse 2, no Levitical priest ever officiated from heaven but Jesus does. And in the second part of verse 1, we see no Levitical priest ever completed his work, but Jesus has. See that in the second part of, of verse 1. He is seated at the right hand of the Father in the tabernacle of God in heaven, as we read there in verse 2. And so we conclude from this, and this, again, this is the main point that the author of Hebrews is making. The work of salvation is finished. He is at rest. Remember in chapter 4, verse 10, where we read, for he who has entered his rest, his rest, you see, since Christ is at rest, 
in the heavenlies, then we are likewise at rest, understanding that the work of salvation is finished, which is evidenced by the fact that he's seated. And so in verse 10 of chapter 4, we had read, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work as Christ did. As we continue reading in verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Talking about the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, who is of the order of Melchizedek, as we spent an extensive time studying last week, it is also, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God told Moses that in Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. But now... He, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, not on earth, but in heaven, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Uh, The word in, in Greek is kraton, and it means better, superior, superior promises. Now, sort of taking all this in, Imagine, and we have a good sort of building to imagine this, this type of thing. Imagine our courtyard setting under the Levitical law. And that courtyard setting that I'm asking you to imagine is the same as the courtyard setting that was also taking place at the temple, which was still in existence under the Levitical law at the time that this epistle to the Hebrews is written. Imagine there's a, there's a fountain there because there is, and you can ceremonially cleanse yourself. But imagine over here there's a, a brazen altar in the center of this courtyard over here. And that you would come in through underneath the portico, and maybe there would be a line going all the way out to the road of each one of you with an animal coming in to present that animal as a sacrifice for sin. And one by one, you would, you would bring forth that animal is a representation that you are indeed a sinner. That animal would be inspected. As I mentioned before, its throat would be slit. It would be bled out. It would be placed on the brazen altar, and and it would be burned. And so the courtyard where the animal was slaughtered would be an extremely bloody place. It would be the equivalent of a a butcher shop or a, a slaughterhouse, however you want to put it. And over here, there would be a a wonderful sort of smell of of barbecue wafting up toward heaven, the the animals that would be roasted um, in whole uh, on that that brazen altar as an indication of sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I like the way we have it today better. Leviticus chapter 17, in speaking of this, put it this way. And I always love Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, because it makes a scientific statement from about 4,000 years ago that withstood or withstands the, the sands of scientific time but it was something that was completely unknown to all these smart men, and I love smart men. Um, Some days I hope I are one, but (laughs) I love love scientists and I love the, the advances that are made in science, but do you know when science discovered that the life of the flesh is in the blood? It wasn't until the 1860s. See, and I talk about this example all the time because it's so, it's such a powerful example that on the Civil War battlefields, 
most of the soldiers died from infection because they thought if, if they were going to amputate a leg or, or surgically repair an internal wound, that they needed to immerse them, their hands in the blood of the previous soldier as an insulation. And what they were doing was passing along in, um, infection that was leading to death and, and devastation among the troops. Why? Because they did not know about the existence of microbes. They did not know about the existence of blood type. They did not know about the example of the life is in the blood. Now, we know the life is in the blood because if you bleed out, uh, you, you can bleed out as the animal would in sacrifice in, in just a few moments, just a few minutes. It doesn't take that long. And so think about the power of the statement, and I say this all the time as well, and, and you're welcome to say it too. I didn't make it up, but it's, it's a great saying. The Bible is not a book of science, but it makes many scientific statements from thousands of years ago, this being one of those. And it's incredible that every, every single scientific statement that the Bible makes was true then, has been true over time, and is still true today. And the Bible is way in front of all of these scientists that we regard, you know, that have all the letters after their name and everything. And again, I appreciate um, brilliant men. Uh, no, no put down on, on, on any of that um, intellectualism and, and the exploration. It's just interesting how science has changed over the years. It used to be that scientists sought to discover the nature of God in science. And now scientists seek to prove that, uh, that God doesn't exist with science. And that, that's, quite a, that's quite a sea change. And that also took place in and around the 1860s, ironically enough, um, principally uh, Charles Darwin and, and people of his ilk. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yes, it is. And God says, I have, and this is part of the Jewish law, 613 commands in the Jewish law. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, we trip ahead to Hebrews chapter 9, one chapter ahead of where we presently are, and I'm sure you're probably mostly familiar, most of you are familiar with this verse, where it says in verse 22 of chapter 9, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, the, the blood of that sacrificial animal, some of it would be collected and it would be sprinkled. And if the sacrifice was for the high priest, the blood would be sprinkled on the, the garmentry of the high priest, which would be the most fabulous garment in the land, the most expensive clothing in the land, and the first thing that you do upon you know, arraying yourself with that, that garmentry that's described in, in the book of Exodus is an animal would be slaughtered for your sin as a high priest, and you'd be sprinkled with blood, and then you'd take some of that blood, you'd dip, dip hiss, hiss up in that blood, carry it into the Holy of Holies, and, and sprinkle the golden altar of the Lord. Sprinkle the mercy seat, sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant, with the blood of the sacrifice. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the author of Hebrews pointing out to these Jewish believers, if you look back to the law and the comparison is being made, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And that's the reason that the work of the Levitical priests and the Levitical priesthood was never finished because as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse four, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, not possible. Um, Micah chapter six puts it this way. You've probably heard some of this passage, if not all of it. In Micah chapter six, Verses 6 through 8, we read, With what shall I come before the Lord? Under the sacrificial system. The Levitical priesthood. The old covenant. With what shall I come before the Lord? It's page 818 if you're looking. At least it is in my Bible. 
Anybody got 18? Bingo. That really brings you back to your church experience, right? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, as some of the pagan worshipers would do with their gods? Abhorrent to God, by the way. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Money that I've made, possessions that I own. Is that what God wants? And remember, this is Old Testament, this is Old Covenant. This is the old way. This is a ritualistic system. Is this, what, is this really what God desires? That I would bring these things to him? That I would bring this stuff to him? Well, the answer is, he has shown you, oh man, what's good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly. This is a part you've probably heard. Maybe it's on your refrigerator. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so this, in context, is, is the summation of what God was really looking for through the Old Covenant. But the Old Covenant became a brittle ritual, much like in the modern church when we have a celebration like Mardi Gras, which is a, a rampant few days of debauchery in New Orleans and Mobile and places like that along the coast, coming out of, believe it or not, a faith system. It was news to me that you've got 40 days of Lent coming up, so in this 40 days of something that you've chosen to fast from, hopefully that, that behavior of debauchery and carnality, that, that you, would have, you would spend a few days partying before you embarked on that 40 days of Lent leading up to Easter, and, and you would party hardy for several days, and you would do whatever you wanted to do. And, and you think God admires what takes place in Lent? You put the ash on your forehead. You're really sober about it. You're serious. I get it. What about those several days before that? What about Fat Tuesday? It's called Fat Tuesday because of the, all the, the excess and the beads it's a pretty wicked system if you think about it. Did God, is, that, is, that what God had, and is that what God had in mind? And, and it is the human condition that if we've got something to sacrifice, then we can do something that's wicked as long as we have the sacrifice to offer to cover our wickedness. Uh, just like the people that come in here on Sunday morning, and as soon as they leave, they head right to the bar. I don't think any of you do that. Or some other illicit behavior. Why? Because they've done their penance. They've done their time. Is that what God's looking for? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. That's Old Testament stuff. Old Testament stuff. The blood of remission, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the blood of remission covers sin but cannot cure it. This word atonement, the day of atonement, it's a covering. It's a kofar in the, the Hebrew. And maybe you've never understood this, Sometimes it becomes clear when we think about how we employ the word remission. You see, if you have cancer in your body and that's a threat to your life, and you go through the series of, of whatever medical procedures that you have to go through in that, in that terrible trauma and trial, and then the news comes back to you that the cancer is in remission, and that's wonderful news. Celebratory news, yes, but in remission, the cancer is still there, isn't it? 
And so you live, you sort of live with that in the back of your mind that that is the condition that you live in. The blood of redemption, on the other hand, that we are moving towards, away from the blood of remission, now we are moving to the blood of redemption. The blood of redemption purchases your soul to make you a child of God. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. See, the, the blood of animals could never change who you are. The blood of animals could only cover you in God's eyes. The blood of Christ purchases your soul, making you a child of God. Everything in the God-given design of remission, nothing wrong with the design of the blood of remission, everything, every single thing, the tabernacle, then the temple, all the furnishings in the tabernacle, the robes of the priests, and especially the high priests and the turbans and all that regalia that they wore, the tabernacle, the temple, later on, the furnishings, all the furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the altar of sacrifice in the outer court, the you know, the, the table of showbread, the, the golden lampstand, all of it, every bit of it, the, the table of incense, all of it, all of the God-given design of, of the process of remission was meant to point to redemption once Messiah has come. And we see that in verse 5. It talks about a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. Moses was instructed by God to make the tabernacle, to build the tabernacle, and you can read all about that in, in Exodus. It's, it's a fascinating story and study, especially as you see it through the eyes of, of the picture that God is desiring to present to his people, that, that they would be looking forward to Messiah it, it is a, a copy, it is a shadow, it, it is a pattern that God gave Moses specific instruction for exactly what the tabernacle was supposed to be made out of and exactly the dimensions of the tabernacle and exactly the size and the shape of the tabernacle and exactly the location of the tabernacle. It was to be placed right in the center of the camp. And it's fascinating if you actually do the math in the book of Numbers about the array of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel around that tabernacle that was placed in the center of the camp and you do a population count, you will see something quite interesting that as that arrangement is viewed from a mountaintop looking down on the camp with the tabernacle at the center of the camp, if you count up the people, you've got this many people on the north side, and you got this many people on the west side, and you got this many people on the east side, and you got this many people on the south side. Wow, it's a picture of the cross in the desert. Who would have thought? It's an amazing thing. It's all designed to point to the Messiah when he comes. David was given instruction by God about the temple later on. Exact dimensions, exact instructions, a building plan, if you will, the Holy Spirit gave to him. It's spoken of when David was not allowed to build the temple because he was a man of war. He had blood on his hands, so he passed along the plans to his son Solomon, who was the king who came after him, giving Solomon instruction, follow these plans when you build the temple. Do it exactly the way the Holy Spirit showed me to do that. And you can read about that in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 10 through 12. And then it's all a picture of, you know, what we see later on, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, but I saw no temple in it, talking about the new Jerusalem in the kingdom, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. It's all, it's all pointing. It's all, it's all pointing to the, the throne room of God. It's amazing stuff if, if you think about it. When Christ came offering himself as the sacrifice for our, now let's couple a couple words here because it's very important. 
Christ came sacrificing himself, offering himself of his own will, not my will, but thy will be done. He prayed in the garden the night before his death, understanding the necessity of, of the suffering that he was going to go through, the, the brutality, the stripes that his body would bear, but above all else, the separation from his father for those moments when darkness came over the land and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When all of the sin, past, present, and future of the whole world was placed upon him under his desire, under his will, under God's plan that he would be made the perfect sacrifice for sin. But he was the perfect sacrifice not just for the sins that we committed, but for our sin nature. We say it all the time. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You were born a sinner. You were born with a sin nature. You came into this world after the fall of man. The study that the University of Minnesota did of of infants who were born into the world. If left to themselves, they would all become reprobates. Nobody has to teach a baby to lie. Nobody has to teach a baby to be selfish. They come by it quite naturally. Nobody has to teach a toddler how to throw a tantrum at the checkout stand as they see all the stuff that they put there in order to entice toddlers to throw a temper tantrum at the checkout stand so that you'll be so embarrassed that you'll just give up and give them that thing that they want. They, they mine, 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 mine. Um, that's, that's who we are, that's, that's how we are, and that continues through the course of our life. Now, you know, through proper discipline, we are um, sort of made culturally acceptable for the most part, and uh, it's part of the problem with our culture now with so much fatherlessness in, in the home, um, especially in the inner cities, there is a real breakdown because there is not enough discipline going on, and the court system and the penal system is not capable of doing the degree of discipline that's necessary. It's way too far downstream. That needs to happen early and often and regularly and, and with love and affection in the same way that our Father in Heaven disciplines us as, as children of God. But Jesus came offering himself as the sacrifice for our sin nature. And the sacrificial system involving animals, once Jesus came and made that sacrifice, the sacrificial system involving animals was ended. Now, it may have continued on for a few more years, about 30 years, for example, but think about what happened when the temple was destroyed at Jerusalem. Your Jewish friends today, how do they deal with their sin? Because under Jewish law, the Levitical system, the 613 commands of the Jewish law, it requires a sacrifice for sin, blood sacrifice. After the temple was destroyed, that has no longer happened. It has no longer taken place. And so for all these centuries, the Jewish people, people of the Jewish faith, have been separated from their system, their religious system by which they achieved or accomplished remission of sins. And of course that's been replaced by mournfulness, feeling bad, you get to the Day of Atonement, if you have Jewish friends, you know, they kind of think about all the bad things that they've done in the prior year and they think about all the good things that they've done and hopefully in the balance of scales they've done more good things and they've done bad things and and if they've done, you know, whatever bad things that they feel really bad on that day. And, and it's genuine, I believe, in, in most hearts. But it is such an ineffective system. You see, once Jesus came and paid the price for the sin of the whole world, the Levitical priesthood system of sacrifices was, was ended. It is no longer of any effect. You can sacrifice animals for your sin all you want to, but it's meaningless to God. God has moved on. Relationship with God has moved from external to internal. 
which necessitated a new covenant between God and man based upon better promises, as we read there in verse 6. And we continue in verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now, for homework, write down that you can read Leviticus chapter 26. And Le Leviticus chapter 26, I'd love to read it this morning, but time doesn't permit. This whole chapter is nothing but a listing of, here's what's going to happen to you, here's how you're going to be blessed if you keep my covenant. And then at the end of that, he moves into, here's how you're going to be cursed if you do not keep my covenant. Which side do you think they landed on? We know, don't we? That was the necessity of, of the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, listen to this part, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Being born again means you are a child of God. If there's any curiosity in your mind about the phrase born again and, and, and what it means, it means you, you've been living as a glorified animal even under systems of religion even under faith systems that may be very genuine in their intent, that once the fall of man took place, the Holy Spirit was what died in man, and man became nothing more than a glorified animal with a, a duality of nature, the, the soul and the flesh. And the soul, fortunately for us, has eternity written in the heart. The soul has a conscience that is in complete agreement with the Word of God, if you check it out and you read through the things that Jesus says, even if you're an unbeliever, you don't even think Jesus existed as a historical figure, you don't believe in God whatsoever, but read the things that Jesus said and watch the way that he walked through the world and your conscience will say, wow, that was a very good man. That was, that was maybe the best man that I've ever read about. But now... The opportunity exists that you would return to the way that you were created in the first place, or the way that man was created in the first place as a triune being in the same way that God is a triune being. And that's why God said, let us create man in our image. Let us create man in our image. Who are the us? Well, the us is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The one God in three distinct persons, you also have the capacity especially in your initial creation, to be flesh, soul, and spirit. And, and so intrinsically, even in the battle that's waged between the soul and the flesh, because the, the flesh is led by the devil, the flesh is drawn into temptation, and the soul with willpower and all that sort of stuff and understanding by the conscience, I shouldn't be doing that, but the flesh will eventually win out. And the enemy will make sure that a temptation comes along that you cannot resist. And so people fall readily into drug addiction and alcoholism and, and kleptomancy and, and all this other stuff, or, or just you know the pursuit of worldly riches as, as being somehow satisfac satisfactory to the soul. But it never is. It never is. And in being born again, you are inviting now the life of the Spirit of God into your heart. And it's amazing that we are allowed that privilege, but being born again means, and you know this, you are a blood-bought child of God indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. And what had been dead in you since the fall of man has been made alive. This is a supernatural event. There's, there's no natural explanation for this. 
And there's not meant to be a natural explanation for this. And all of you who are born again are completely aware of this truth. I'm, I'm living a supernatural life, and I have been ever since I was 38 years old when I became born again. When I placed my trust and my faith in the blood of Jesus to save my soul. And exactly what the Bible declared about being born again took place in my life. The Holy Spirit made himself alive in me by my determination that I wanted the Holy Spirit to be made alive in me. It's a great thing. It's not natural. That's why Paul says, you know, and, and to some of you here today, um, maybe you're, you're like the dog hearing something that's, that's unfamiliar to you, and you're like, I, 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 I don't get that. And I understand that you don't get that because it's like Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. What we're talking about here today, this makes no sense to somebody who's not born again. It might be an encouragement that, wait a minute, even intellectually, because this is so logical and because this does make such good sense and because my conscience is crying out of its deepest need for God, which is why the conscience is implanted in you, to bring you to Christ, that maybe you would be drawn. But for those of us who are born again, and I would hope and pray, and I really believe that this is a church comprised mostly of born-again people, and to be a Christian, you must be born again, that's the baseline. You may not like the phrase. Somehow it's become unpopular in our generation to say you're born again. It puts you in the class of being some sort of weirdo or fanatic. There's all these, all these nice Christians that don't wear their faith on their sleeve. I like those kinds of Christians, don't you? They never say anything about God, and they certainly don't ever say anything about Jesus. They never hassle me at all. But then you have these weirdos over here, these fanatics over here that are born again, and they're always talking about Jesus. They bring Jesus into every conversation. They bring Jesus into the workplace. They have a Bible on their desk in the workplace. I don't, I don't like those people because they're reminding me that I face eternal judgment. Don't like to be confronted with eternal judgment. I'll come to church, don't want to make any kind of commitment. And even in your conscience, there is a perception. I had the perception for many years, half my life, that Jesus was going to require something of me. I didn't know what it was, but look at me now. This is not natural life. It's not intended to be. It's not imitation. It's the impartation of the Spirit. And the promise of God that whatever he asks of you, he will also give you the power to accomplish. Amen. And of course, he is going to guide you on the path of righteousness. You know what is the best path for your life? A path of righteousness. And God loves you so much that he will be he will make certain, if you're listening, he will always guide you into what is in your best interest. These are better promises spoken of here because the work these promises are based upon is finished. If, if the ultimate goal is salvation, now we remain here for other purposes, purposes of God, but we can rest. Your heart is finally at rest. You, you finally have peace with God. All that you've been seeking your whole life, all that these people are experiencing um, as they drive up and down Three Oaks this morning, driving by the church and maybe, maybe giving a glance over and seeing how many cars are in the parking lot and trying to make some sort of determination if, if they'll try this church or they'll try that church. All that is driven by the fact that everybody out there, and you know this for, your, for yourself as well as for them, that you lack peace in your heart. Winning a Super Bowl does not produce peace in your heart. Having the corner office does not produce peace in your heart. It only proves to you that there's still a longing for peace even after you have achieved those great, what would be perceived to be victories in life. God makes sure of it. 
There's an emptiness in life until that emptiness is filled with the Spirit of God. But once that emptiness is filled with the Spirit of God, there is a peace, there is rest, certain of your eternal destiny. I know I'm going to heaven. Do you? I know I'm going to heaven. I, I have complete rest about that. And there's also a satisfaction that, that comes from serving the Lord and, and walking according to his will. And we can rest in the knowledge the purchase price for our souls has been paid. The blood of redemption. It's already been shed. It's been paid, not only paid, but paid in full. Jesus said to tell to Telestai from the cross, and that's what it means. It was a full and satisfactory sacrifice approved by the Father. And the resurrected Spirit of Christ has been made alive in us, born of our desire, or another word for that is faith, to be one with God in Christ. And in Romans chapter 10, Paul put it this way about the simplicity of, of coming to Christ and, and knowing these things and, and having the life of the Holy Spirit in your heart. He wrote in Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Do you see anything that has to be done? Do you see anything about cleaning up your life before you do that? Do you see anything that would prevent a murderer in a jail cell from taking that step? Or a rapist? Or a swindler? Or a businessman who just shades deal after deal after deal and, and misrepresents the product they sell or, or whatever it may be? No, it, it, it has nothing to do with any of that because it's a matter of the heart and to understand that when the Holy Spirit is made alive in you and you do have the assurance of salvation, you also have another assurance and that is that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you on paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that you would be a child of God and that people would know you're a child of God and that they would see that change in your life. It's powerful stuff. You won't be imitating the Holy Spirit, Jesus. You know, what would Jesus do? Well, that was a nice sentiment, but it's, it's not biblically correct. Because Jesus is inside of you. Allow Jesus to do what he does. And he will. It, it's a matter of, of your allowance. And, and he goes on to explain, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no religious construct in there. There's nothing required other than to turn to the Lord, which is what it means to repent, to turn away from the world, turn to the Lord, Tell the Lord that you trust that he is the Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead. And it's even the Holy Spirit who will quicken your spirit to believe that God has raised Christ from the dead. Even, even belief is not something that requires anything of you because the Holy Spirit will teach you according to his word that he authored the things that you will come to believe with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. He says, this is the covenant in verse 10 of chapter 8 that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. After what days? After Christ has been crucified. After Christ has been buried. After Christ has been raised from the dead. After Christ has walked this earth for 40 years in his resurrected body. After Christ has ascended to heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father of God. After these things... Even for the house of Israel, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
And the necessity of this new covenant that we're speaking of here today, if your Bible's like mine, um, beginning at verse 8, you'll notice that the majority of the letters are italicized. And the reason that the, the majority of the letters are italicized, that means that, that these, this passage is quoting exactly verbatim, word for word, from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, which is the announcement of the new, new covenant. And that came in the Old Testament. That came 500 years before Christ. God foreseeing, foretelling to his children that are looking forward to Messiah, there's going to be a new covenant, guys. And the new covenant is vastly superior to the old covenant. Why? Because it's written on your heart. Same law, same God, same will, same word, same righteousness, same holiness, same standard, only instead of this cumbersome set of scrolls that you would carry around and consult and read, it's in here. It's portable. It's with you wherever you are. And so that necessity of a new covenant had been promised 500 years before the coming of Christ, and yet the law is not ended. Psalm chapter 19, speaking of of the law of God, says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And and of course, we remember that in Matthew's gospel in chapter 5, in speaking of the law, Jesus said this at, at, at kind of the beginning of the, in, in the early stages of the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that I came to destroy the law. This is Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the fulfillment of the law is to have it written on your heart. And to have the, whole, the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into your life according to that, that law. He says, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, One jot or one tittle, those were the the fine marks that comprised the the Hebrew letters, kind of like dotting the I or crossing the T. One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And this is a fulfillment in part of the law that is being fulfilled in our days, in our midst. So the law is still in existence. Its modus operandi has changed. It's M.O. Maybe you didn't follow the old covenant because you didn't want to. Maybe you didn't follow the old covenant because you didn't have a copy of it. And as much as you tried to learn it, 613 rules and regulations in the Hebrew law? I mean, how many of you have the Ten Commandments memorized? Show of hands in your heart. So it could be just the fact that you're, you're away from your teacher, you're away from the instruction, or, or even thinking about you pertaining to real estate law and whatever your life situation is. Do you know the real estate law? Well, it's on the books. It's available. You could consult it. And maybe you could go to Lee County Courthouse and pick up a copy of the present real estate law determining, you know, the sale of the house and, you know, all that and the assessments and all that sort of stuff and the property taxes and all that sort of stuff. But to memorize that and to follow that law according to the letter of the law That's extremely difficult, and that may have been the reason that they fell away from the law. They just didn't have it with them. It may not be an excuse, but it may be a reason. But now, it's all all right here. God placed it in our hearts when we were born again. This This is the new covenant. So that law is now completely available 
by the author of the law being resident in your heart at all times and in every location. Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, in speaking of this, and we read this all the time around here because of the necessity of the power of the Holy Spirit being involved in our lives. In, in John's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus, talking about the fact that he was going to be crucified and separated from them uh, on the very next day, he says, however, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into what? Into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. It's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Pretty powerful. That's not true of the Old Covenant. And again, this is not fanciful religious speculation or imagining. It's reality for all those who are born again in Christ Jesus are, think about this word, Lord. He's the master of our lives who now instructs us according to his will which is entirely based upon his great eternal love for us and of his desire we be transformed into the image of Christ and true of everyone you become like what you worship you become you 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 begin to resemble either the thing that you worship or you begin to resemble the person you worship and that's why God would have us worship Christ alone Romans chapter 12 puts it this way, famously. In the first two verses, I beseech you, and Paul begging believers, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And, and it is indeed reasonable, given the nature of the sacrifice that, that Jesus has made to save your soul. That, that blood of redemption, the, the price that he paid for your sin nature. And it says, and, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, and all that takes place, God is so merciful to us, all that takes place in each individual life at the speed of the Holy Spirit. I am being transformed as the Holy Spirit transforms me. And it takes place at a different rate, in different times, on a different schedule, in each person. Why? Because God knows each and every one of us are unique. And he will bring you along with his ultimate goal of transforming you into the image of Christ. That you not be, that you be not conformed to this world and the actual way that that takes place, practically speaking, spiritually speaking, is contained in Romans chapter 6, where we read, beginning at verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. The symbolism that's employed of dying to your old self. Therefore we were buried with him through the baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, 
but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Final three verses in Romans chapter eight, I mean uh, Hebrews chapter eight. None of them, and this is a continuing quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Did God forget your sin? God doesn't forget anything. He's, he's, he knows everything. He chooses not to remember your sin. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When God's Holy Spirit is your teacher, as it says in verse 11, not me or not any man, when God's Holy Spirit is your teacher, and when you listen for His voice, and that's something that's a learned behavior in time, and it's interesting how clearly we hear His voice in the moments when we are first born again. It's something... um, it's, it's kind of different in the, in, than the ways of the world. It's like we're more likely not to be listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit after we've been walking with the Lord for 40 years than we are in the first 40 minutes of our life in Christ. And, and that's an amazing phenomenon, and it points out the fact that we need to be listening in every decision that we make. In every decision that we make, no matter how small, no matter how great, God knows the correct decision. The question is, will we allow him input. When God's Holy Spirit is your teacher and when you listen for His voice and follow His ways, you will only learn more and more and more and more of His great love for you. That's what you learn of God by walking according to His ways. You, you learn how much He loves you. And that doesn't mean you're going to avoid difficulties. It doesn't mean you're going to be removed from trials. Not at all. But it means that through those difficulties and through those trials, whatever they may be and however great they may be, you learn more and more and more of of the love of God for you and how important the sacrifice of his son becomes for you. And and now there is an equality, a measuring, even, even a better understanding, even emotionally. There's nothing wrong with being emotional about considering the sacrifice of blood that Jesus Christ paid to save you from your sin nature. And so that great emotional turmoil of laying your hands on the head of the animal and watching that animal buckle under that, that loss of blood and, and, and the destruction that is coming as a result of your sin, now you take that to a higher place, understanding exactly the price that's been paid for your life. It was God in flesh. He came and died to pay the price for your sins. And so now this, even in the emotional realm, what takes place is um, according to what God has done for you, demonstrating his love for you, his concern for you, his care for you, and the process by which which this takes place of, of, of leading you back to God constantly because you still live in this body of flesh. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's where it begins, followed by repentance. The Holy Spirit is very faithful to tell you when you've done wrong. And he offers you the opportunity to repent of what you've done wrong. And he brings you to a place of confession, which is agreeing with God about what I've done wrong. And then comes forgiveness. Forgiveness. And see, the problem with the Jews, or the Jewish believers, may have been that with that, they've done something. 
none of this, all of this is invisible. Conviction, repentance, confession, seeking God for forgiveness. It, it's all invisible. It has no physical impact on your body. But yet it is entirely more, po- more powerful. Some of you may be familiar with 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which reads this way. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to release us from all unrighteousness. Same thing that's said here, your lawless deeds, your sins. I will remember them no more. And so this love emanates, it resonates, it radiates, it's unconditional. It's merciful. It's sacrificial. It's eternal. It's personal. And it's irreplaceable, especially when it comes to any thought, any thought, of returning to the old covenant practices in this new covenant life. When Jesus was dead... He gave up his spirit. He wasn't killed. He yielded his spirit. He made himself a sacrifice for our sins. Something dramatic happened. The veil in the temple, 80 or 90 feet tall, some people say 18 inches thick, it took several hundred priests just to handle that piece of cloth. That piece of cloth was rent. It was torn from top to bottom. And now the Holy of Holies that had never been made visible to man, especially in their lifetimes, except to the, whole, the high priest, once per year, was there was a picture there. The veil is torn. We are all welcome to come now into the Holy of Holies, as it had been declared in chapter 4, verse 16, in the book of Hebrews. Let us, therefore, because of Christ, his body, we're going to learn when we get later in the book of Hebrews, his body is the veil. And that veil was torn. Why? That we may come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. We we get to go right into the Holy of Holies. We have the privilege. We are, in fact, commanded to come right into the throne room of God with whatever our needs may be. And when that happened... You know, a lot of church systems, they came in with their teams of, of experts and they sewed that veil back up. And they put a man in a booth that you go to to confess your sins, as if that had any meaning at all. And then the poor Jewish people in this day, and we love the Jews, we serve a Jewish Messiah, nothing against the Jews. We, we pray all the time that they would, they would come to the completion of their faith the rational completion of their faith and trusting in the Messiah that they've always believed in. But they missed, and and now they don't have any way of dealing with their sins. You know what psychologists say? I don't like to quote psychologists, but it's interesting what they say sometimes. They say the leading cause of depression is the sense of unforgiven sin. Unforgiven sin. And so that's why they have spent whatever time they've spent telling people that that's not a sin. That's not a sin. And so the cultural norms that had been in place through the establishment of this Judeo-Christian ethic in our culture, those things are being torn down. And rather than dealing with the sin, they tell people, that's, just not, that's not a sin. Stop, think, stop thinking of that as a sin. And by the way, here's some medication to help you along the way. All that's ended. It's obsolete. The, the word is paleuo, and it means it's dead. It means it's decayed. And the only choice that remains is to, in the first case, be born again, that the Holy Spirit may be made alive in your heart. And in the second case, if you are born again, listen for his voice. 
and follow the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That is what the new covenant is all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the, again, the clarity of your word and Lord, just the importance of all of the things that are discussed in this very important and and sometimes confusing book. Uh, Lord, we confess that it takes many readings through uh, to begin to comprehend the depth and the the magnitude of all that is declared here. And so, Father, we understand that none of us, not one of us, can fully comprehend the, the glory that is being expressed here but we at least can approach it and we can see it with the eyes of our hearts, the glory and and the majesty of the privilege of being transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the Holy Spirit in our heart, leading us into all righteousness for your sake. And Lord, that is both a glorious, we recognize that it's a glorious privilege but it's also a great responsibility to be salt and light in this world, especially as we see that the light of this world has grown so very dark, and whatever salt exists in this world has become tasteless. Lord, we acknowledge the importance of what we do in these last days. For fathers to be the priests over their household, a heavenly priesthood, a royal priesthood declared in 1 Peter chapter 1. Lord, the, the excitement of being set free from any sort of religious regimentation and just being launched free, wonderfully so, into a personal relationship with you where we can converse with you, where we can approach you anytime we like in the same way that every child is always welcomed by their father only to a greater degree because no matter where we are, there you are. Wherever we are in this world, this new covenant promises us the guiding and leading of the Holy Spirit but only for those who allow it to be so. Only for those who place their trust in the saving, redemptive work accomplished on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that power of resurrected life demonstrated on that Sunday morning when he came out of that grave and when he became alive again in the presence of all those who had given up hope. Lord, maybe someone here today has given up hope for the glory that is possible in this life. And Lord, I I know that I know that your Holy Spirit is, is tenderly working on that heart or those hearts. Your Holy Spirit is a, a generous, kind loving spirit. We, we read in Romans, it, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It's not, it's not the lash. It's not the whip. It's not the brutality of, of the world. It, it's a gentility. It's a, a love that we've never known before, but have always sought. And so, Father, w- would you freely give your love to anyone who is in need of it this morning? And I know there are, there are many hurting people here today. There are people going through trials that need a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. But above all else, Lord, if there's anyone here today in the sound of my voice that has never opened their heart, as Paul wrote, to declare that Jesus is Lord, to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, if you've never taken that step in your life, I would like to lead you in a word of prayer right now. And the prayer goes like I'm about to say, and it's not the words that will save you, it's the desire of your heart. It's the faith, it's the trust that you place in Jesus Christ and in this new covenant life where the Holy Spirit is made alive in you. Pray these words after me, would you, Lord Jesus? I open my heart 
and I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my God, to be my Savior, and to be my friend. Wash me clean, I pray, of all of my sin. For I've decided this day to follow you, Jesus, forever and ever. And I really mean it. In Jesus' name I pray.